Have you had a drink of water? <coughs> or whiskey or whatever's in here? <coughs> Very nice. Okay, um, well, I think quite a few of you were here last month um, when we talked about special relativity. So I'm going to start off just by um, very briefly reminding ourselves of the main basis of special relativity. The laws of physics remain the same irrespective of the speed, and the speed of light in a vacuum is constant irrespective of the speed of the observer and the speed of the light source, which Einstein arrived at by considering Max Maxwell's equations. Uh, remember we talked about the effect of speed and how this apparently slows down time. Um, going from stationary to the speed of light here, where it goes up to infinity. And um, we looked at uh, frames of reference, defining states of rest and in, 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 um, looking at how, how you have to think about things. And we also looked at the effect on distance and, um, and the effect on how things appear when you're traveling at high speed. Also from this, we worked out that um, mass and energy were equivalent, that mass actually represents energy, and the two are interconvertible by E equals mc squared. Um, we didn't talk about space-time, which is something that we do need to touch on. Um, in special relativity, you had to look at everything from the point of view of a particular inertial frame of reference. It was very difficult to get an overall view of so what was going on. Is there any absolute framework in which you can represent things? The answer is yes, there is, and it's called space-time. So what's space-time? Well, space-time is a four-dimensional structure in which time is represented as a fourth spatial dimension at right angles to the other three. Okay. Now, we can't visualize four dimensions. So the usual way of visualizing space-time is to remove one of the spatial dimensions and replace it with time treated as a spatial dimension. So that's what this shows here. Here's two spatial dimensions. And this is time treated as a spatial dimension. Now, of course, space and time are measured in different units. Space is measured in miles and kilometers. Time is measured in minutes and seconds and hours and things like that. So how do, you, how do we equi equate these two? Well, the answer, of course, is provided by the speed of light. One second in, in time is equivalent to 300,000 kilometers in distance, all right? So we can now represent things in space-time. Here's, here's us in the present here. Um, and we're moving through time along this line here. So a point in space-time is called an event, something that happens at a particular point at a particular point in time. Physical objects are called world lines, and they make lines parallel to the time axis. Stationary objects are traveling vertically, Objects that are moving travel at an angle. The faster they travel, the greater the angle. Okay? Objects traveling at a constant speed travel in straight lines. Objects that are accelerating travel in curved lines. Light always travels at exactly 45 degrees relative to the time axis. Okay? So we have the concept of the future light cone and the past light cone. This is the present. We cannot know the present. We cannot know what happens on Betelgeuse today. Okay, here's Betelgeuse. We can only know what happened on Betelgeuse 600 years ago if it's 600 light years away. If Betelgeuse explodes today, sorry, if Betelgeuse explodes 600 years ago, we will see it today. So the past light cone represents everything that we can <coughs> know about the past. The future light cone represents everything we can influence in the future. We can't send a me message to Betelgeuse today. If we send a message, a message today, it will arrive in 600 years' time, here, okay? Does anybody know who invented space-time? Yeah, a chap called um, Minkowski, Hermann Min Minkowski, who was one of Einstein's math teachers, in fact. Um, he, he died very soon of a burst appendix, unfortunately, not long after inventing space-time. <coughs> This, um, <coughs> this diagram, here's us here, and this is our light cone. This is someone moving at half the speed of light. Now, this is, his light, this is the light cone, but this is his present. 
because he has to be in the center of his light cone. Okay, now this looks pretty weird. So what does this transformation represent? It looks like a distortion, doesn't it? This doesn't look like a right angle. What this represents, in fact, is a rotation of space-time. You're looking at space-time from a different direction. But you must remember that space-time is actually four-dimensional. When you rotate from here to here, you're having to rotate the third spatial dimension, which is not represented in the diagram. And that's why this appears distorted. If we could see in four dimensions, we would see that this apparent distortion is actually just a matter of perspective. It's a bit like projecting the image of a rotating cube onto a flat screen. The sides of the cube don't look square, but because we can understand things in three dimensions, we know what it means. So what are the uses of space-time? Well, one is it does provide an absolute framework for representing events. People don't agree on distances. They may not agree on time, but they will always agree on the separation of two events in space-time, no matter how fast they're traveling. Okay? The other use of space-time is when we come to talk about general relativity, which is what today's talk is about. Special relativity deals with straight lines in space-time. General relativity deals with curved lines in space-time. And more importantly, when space-time itself becomes curved, which is uh, what Einstein's view of gravity is. So now let's move on to talk about general relativity. Um, what's this? Newton's law of gravity. Newton stated that gravity is a force between any two objects. It's proportional to the mass of one object multiply the mass by the mass of the other object divided by the square of the distance between them. G is the gravitational constant, of course. It was realized by, both by Einstein and by other physicists and, math and mathematicians that Newton's law of gravity was mathematically incompatible with the theory of relativity. Ultimately, they could not both be true. The reason for this is actually pretty obvious. In order for everyone to agree on, on, on this law, they ha you have to agree what these masses are and what this distance is. I'm in a spaceship whizzing past here at half the speed of light. From my perspective, I'm stationary, and these planets are whizzing past me at half the speed of light. Therefore, they would have a huge amount of kinetic energy, and therefore their mass would have increased. Okay? Not only that, but the distance between them would have decreased if I was traveling along the line parallel here. So I think you can see how that would produce inconsistent predictions. In order for Newton's law to be universally applicable, you require absolute mass, absolute distance, and absolute time. Theory, theory of relativity have, has abolished all those absolutes, so it doesn't work. Okay. From the point of view of relativity, Newton's law is an approximation to the true law of gravity for objects traveling at low speeds. It doesn't work for objects traveling at relativistic speeds. So Einstein's remit in general relativity was to rewrite the law of gravity in such a way as to integrate gravity into the theory of relativity. Okay. Now, it was thought for much of the last century that special relativity was very difficult for ordinary people to comprehend. General relativity was completely out of, the, out of the window. Nobody could understand it. I don't think that's true. I don't think general relativity is any more difficult to understand than special relativity from the purely conceptual point of view. In one point, it's actually easier to understand because you don't have the same contradictions as you have in special relativity. In special relativity, different viewpoints give contradictory views of reality. In general relativity, however, different viewpoints, by and large, give complementary views of reality. Not completely by any means, but to a much greater extent, so it's much easier to get an overall feel for what's going on. On the other hand, the mathematics of general relativity is very much more forbidding than the mathematics of special relativity. But I won't be going into that in any detail, because I'm not a mathematician. I'll just be using pictures and diagrams to explain what's going on. Um, so, how can we... Uh, how can we set about rewriting the law of gravity? Well, there's one feature which is pretty obvious about, Einstein, about uh, Newton's equation, and that is that time does not come into Newton's law. Newton's law describes the force of gravity at an instant in time. Effectively, according to Newton, force of gravity acts instantaneously over any distance. If you were to change one of these masses, how long would it take for the force on the other mass to change? Instantaneously. Now, in order to become compatible with relativity, what has to happen is that the effect of gravity <coughs> has to travel at the same speed as light. Now, what on earth do I mean by that? Well, 
This is a little mind picture just to illustrate what I mean by this. Now, this is a totally impossible situation, a ridiculous situation. It doesn't actually matter from the point of view of the illustration. We'll return from fiction to reality at the end. Here's the Earth orbiting around the Sun. I want you to imagine what would happen if all of a sudden the Sun ceased to exist. Sun gone. No more Sun, right? From the time that the Sun ceased to exist, it would be a little over eight minutes before we would see the Sun disappear and it would become very dark and start to become very cold. Now the question you have to ask is this, what would happen to the Earth's trajectory during those eight minutes? According to Newton's law, the instant that the Sun ceased to exist, the force holding all of the planets in their orbits would cease to exist. So all of the planets would instantaneously change their trajectories from ellipses into straight lines. Okay? Now if relativity is true, that cannot happen, because although the Sun no longer exists, the Sun's gravitational field still exists, and the Sun's gravitational field cannot change faster than the speed of light. So only at the point at which the Sun disappeared as seen from the Earth, only at that point in time would it change its trajectory from an ellipse into a straight line. <clears throat> so as the shadow of darkness spreads outwards through the solar system, as each planet goes out, as each planet becomes dark, that's the point at which it would change its trajectory. <clears throat> now once we have <clears throat> the effect of gravity travelling at a finite speed, we have the possibility of gravitational waves and gravitational radiation just as James Clark's Maxwell described electromagnetic radiation traveling through space at, at the speed of light, so Einstein described gravitational radiation traveling, traveling through space at the speed of light. In reality, however, gravitational waves are normally extremely weak under most circumstances, very, very weak, because the force of gravity is much weaker than the electromagnetic force. Also because Objects don't just suddenly disappear like that. <clears throat> they do move around, they do uh, vi vibrate, but the rate of vibration is very slow. Here's the moon orbiting around the Earth. It takes a whole month for the moon to orbit around the Earth. Whereas electromagnetic radiation, light for example, is millions of times a second. Also, they tend to cancel out over large distances <coughs> because as well as the moon orbiting around the Earth, the Earth orbits around the centre of gravity and the two are in opposite phases. So as seen from Mars, you detect very little in the way of gravitational radiation. The centre of gravity of the Earth-Moon system doesn't change. Okay. Well, gravitational waves are very advanced. We've got to go right back to the beginning and think about how to rewrite the law of gravity. This is Henri Poincaré, the French mathematician that we talked about last time. He was one of the first people to realize that Newton's law was incompatible with relativity. He was also a philosopher. <clears throat> one of the things he was interested in <clears throat> is when you're working on something difficult and you don't know how to do it, all of a sudden you get a flash of inspiration that comes into your mind and so you suddenly realize, ah, yes, I know how to do it. He described it very well. He couldn't explain it. He himself has experienced this a number of times during his mathematical career. He, once he was working on a difficult set of equations, he couldn't work out how to work them out. And he said he was stepping off a bus in France and suddenly he th something clicked in his brain and he thought, ah, I know how to do it. And then he went home and worked it out. Great flashes of inspiration. Now both Newton and Einstein had flashes of inspiration of this type when talking about gravity. <coughs> Everyone knows the story about Newton, of course. He was watching an apple fall off a tree when he realized that the force that pulls the apple off the tree is the same as the force that holds the moon in its orbit around the Earth. And once he knew how far away the moon was, he was able to demonstrate this mathematically. Einstein also had a flash of inspiration. Now, there is a story about a man falling off a roof in Berlin and saying while he was falling, he couldn't feel the force of gravity. That's not true. It, uh, that's a story made up. He was sitting in his office, in a patent office in Bern in Switzerland in, in 1907 two years after developing special relativity. And he was thinking about falling off a roof, and he was thinking while he was falling, he would actually be weightless. He would not be feeling the force of gravity. Consequently, his viewpoint would be that he was hanging motionless in empty space, and the Earth was accelerating up to meet them. That was a valid way of looking at it. His viewpoint would be entirely valid. So he thought, maybe, you know, 
there's a different way of looking at gravity. And the way he did it was as follows. Newton described gravity as a force. He had to describe it as a force because his first law of motion states that an object not acted on by an unbalanced force remains at rest or travelling at a constant speed in a straight line. However, even Newton would have recognised that gravity is quite unlike any other force. Firstly, it's always exactly proportional to the mass of the object. Now, why should that be? Mass is defined as inertia, not as weight. Also, a falling object in a uniform... Just a question about that. Did you make assumption that gravitational mass and inertial mass are the same thing? Exactly. With Newton's law, you have to assume they're the same thing. Well, mass is defined as inertia. Mass is actually defined as inertia, it's not defined as weight. Um, secondly, a, an object falling freely in a uniform gravitational field is completely unstressed because each and every particle of that object is accelerating at exactly the same speed. Okay? Non-uniform gravitational field can stress an object, obviously a tidal force, but a uniform gravitational field doesn't. Einstein turned the whole argument around the other way. Gravity isn't a force at all, he said. Rather, it's an apparent acceleration of virtual acceleration, if you like. Right? What this means in effect is that Newton's first law of motion is not universally true. It's only true in the absence of a gravitational field. In a gravitational field, objects on which no force are acting do not travel at a constant speed in a straight line. They accelerate downwards. Falling is the normal behaviour of an object in a gravitational field. No force is involved. You're falling because you're in a gravitational field, not because there's force acting on you. To deviate from that requires a force. I'm not falling now because there's a force acting upwards on me, preventing me from falling. It's a static force. It's caused by the rigidity of the floor beneath the soles of my feet. But it's still a mechanical force and it will stress my body in the same way as any other mechanical force would because it's applied selectively to the soles of my feet. So what are the advantages of looking at gravity as an acceleration rather than as a force? Well, there are two advantages. Firstly, it automatically explains why everything accelerates at the same speed in a gravitational field. You don't have to puzzle about why the force of gravity is proportional to the mass of the object, as you have to with Newton's law. Secondly, it gave Einstein the clue he needed as to how to reinterpret gravity. He can reinterpret gravity by combining the axioms of relativity with the mathematics of acceleration. <coughs> Not an easy task. The mathematics of acceleration are quite a lot more complex than the mathematics of travelling at a constant speed in a straight line. The gravitational fields vary according to the inverse square law. You put that together and you have a complicated set of mathematical functions you have to deal with. It turned out to be extremely difficult. It took Einstein many years of hard work and very complex mathematics before he reached his goal. But at least he knew where to start. Now this diagram is to illustrate what I mean by a virtual acceleration. This rectangle here represents this room. And this is us in the room here. However, I'd like you to imagine that the entire room, instead of being stationary on the surface of the Earth, is in a spaceship out in empty space, and the spaceship is coasting freely through space. Now, under those circumstances, we would all be weightless. We'd all be floating around the room, the chairs would be floating around the room, you can just imagine what it would be like, okay? Pretty chaotic, I would imagine. The spaceship then switches on its rocket engines and accelerates in that direction at... 9.8 meters per second per second, 1g. We would all fall to the floor, the chairs would fall to the floor. We could arrange the chairs around and sitting comfortably exactly as we are now. All right? Now let's assume that the spaceship has very quiet, vibration-free engines. Einstein's point was this, that in terms of the local effect, the effect of resisting the gravitational field and the effect of accelerating into space are absolutely physically identical. There's no physical test that we can do inside this room to distinguish between whether we are resisting a gravitational field. So the spaceship technically has to be accelerated at 9.8 meters per second to maintain that. If it just yeah. went at a certain speed, you'd end up floating off anyway. It doesn't matter about, yeah, if, if it's going at a constant speed, you'll be weightless. It has to be accelerating. Right, exactly. It has to have the engines running, it has to be accelerating. The only difference would be the view out of the window. We can't do any physical test in this room to see whether we're resisting a gravitational field or whether we're accelerating into space. Right? So how does gravity create this illusion of an acceleration? It does so by bending space-time. Okay? 
But obviously, the surface of the Earth isn't really accelerating upwards. No one's suggesting that. That would be a ridiculous idea. But the local effect is exactly as if, as if that were the case. So how does gravity create this illusion of an acceleration? It does so by bending space-time. Okay? And in order to understand how it does that, you have to understand the effect that gravity has on light. By reinterpreting gravity as an acceleration, it became obvious to Einstein that light must fall. Light has mass, therefore light has inertia, therefore light will fall in the same way as everything else. If you have a light shining from one side of the room to the other, when the room is weightless, the light will shine in a dead straight line and hit the opposite wall there. When the room is accelerating, however, in the time taken for the light to travel from one side of the room to the other, the entire room would have moved upwards ever so slightly. Consequently, the light beam will hit the opposite wall a tiny bit lower down than it would if the room were not accelerating. As observed by someone in the accelerating room, the light does not travel in a dead straight line. It travels in a downward curve. It falls. Okay? Now, of course, light travels extremely fast, so that working out the way in which light falls isn't at all easy. But that's what we have to do if we're going to understand general relativity. So, now let's have a look and see what happens when light moves vertically in a gravitational field. Here's twin A and twin B again. Twin A is in a spaceship fairly high up above most of the Earth's gravitational field. He may be in a high orbit or he may be at a Lagrangian point, doesn't really matter. Twin B is on the surface of the Earth. Now I'd like you to imagine that twin A and B have two identical items of equipment. They have a monochromatic laser light of precisely defined optical frequency that is timed by means of an atomic clock to give very brief flashes of light at exactly one second intervals. All right. A is firing his light down to B. B is firing his light up to A. Now we're going to be looking at falling. And we're going to start off by looking at falling from a Newtonian standpoint. When we complete our analysis, we'll see that the Newtonian standpoint is actually wrong. But we've got to start from somewhere. Okay. A drops an object that falls down to the surface of the Earth. If he was in orbit, he'd have to just cancel out its orbital velocity in order to do that. Why does the object fall? According to Newton, because the force of gravity acts on it and accelerates the object as it falls down to Earth. The force moves through this distance. Force moving through a distance is called work. Uh, and the work done on the object will provide kinetic energy so that by the time it reaches the surface of the Earth, it will be traveling at escape velocity, or almost escape velocity, 11.2 kilometers per second. Now, if you integrate uh, from infinity down to the surface of the Earth using the inverse square law, the amount of work done is the same as if you move the force at the surface of the Earth through a distance equal to the radius of the Earth. So you can think of the Earth's gravitational field as a crater 6,000 kilometers deep. Okay, the depth of the, of the crater is the same as the radius of the Earth. So here's a picture of that. Now I've compressed the lateral um, scale and I've increased the vertical scale to fit it on here. Obviously, otherwise it would be too flat, it wouldn't fit on the screen. So at the surface of the Earth, the slope is one in one, by definition. If you go one Earth radius up, it's one in four. If you go another three Earth radiuses up, that's four from the center of the Earth, it's one in 16 and so on like that. If a falling, exactly the opposite happens if you want to send an object back up there. You have to give it 11.2 kilometers of kinetic energy to raise the object up to A. So it's gaining kinetic energy as it comes down and it's losing kinetic energy as it goes up, right? If that's true of ordinary objects, it must also be true of light. Light has mass, therefore light will be gaining energy as it falls and losing energy as it climbs, right? The amount of energy it gains and loses is, is extremely small, of course, because although light has mass, it has very little mass. So the force acting on the light is absolutely minute. Does the light change its speed? Well, there isn't a simple answer to that, I'm afraid. Um, in special relativity, the speed of light is constant. Absolutely no questions asked. In general relativity, things are a bit more complicated. There is a sense in which gravity and acceleration changes, changes the speed of light. But there's another sense in which it doesn't. It all depends who measures the speed of which clock over which distance. If A and B each have a device for measuring the speed of light 
in their immediate vicinity, they would get exactly the same reading. So one thing to hold on to in general relativity is that if anybody measures the speed of light in their immediate vicinity, they will always get exactly the same answer. However, if somebody measures the speed of light or interprets what the speed of light appears to them at some distance away from themselves, then that isn't necessarily the case. Not when gravity comes into play anyway. We'll come on to that later. For the time being, let's not worry about the speed of the light. Let's focus on the energy of the light. So what happens when light increases its energy? What happens to the light? It becomes blue shifted. Exactly. When it loses energy, it becomes red shifted. So what will happen in this situation is that twin A's light will appear slightly bluer than twin B's light to, to, to twin B. Twin A will see twin B's light slightly redder than his own light. Right? Now, in the case of the Earth's gravitational field, the amount of shift is incredibly small. It's a few parts per billion, but very, very small indeed. Now, the crucial point is this. If you change the color of the light, you change the frequency of the light waves. Blue shift, the frequency increases. Red shift, the frequency decreases. But not only do you change the frequency of the light waves, you also change the frequency of the individual light flashes. The two go hand in hand. In other words, twin B will see twin A's flashes coming at slightly less than one second intervals, Twin A will see twin B's flashes coming at slightly greater than one second intervals. Okay? So the first thing that relativity teaches us about gravity is that gravity slows down time. The deeper you are in a gravitational field, slower time unfolds as compared to someone higher up in the gravitational field. So now we're starting to move away from the Newtonian view of gravity. In Newtonian physics, time is absolute. Not so in relativity. Einstein said there's, there's no reason to suppose that time moves at the same speed in different, different gravitational potentials. Also notice that their viewpoints are, are complementary. It's not like special relativity. They'll agree that time is slowing down as, as you go down, and they'll agree that time is speeding up as you go up. They'll also agree on the amount of time over here. At least they will in mild gravitational fields. We're talking about mild gravitational fields at the moment. Powerful gravitational fields, things get more complicated. That's where, that's where things get interesting. So how can we work out how much time how much time is slowed down here? Well, there are a number of different ways of doing that. One is you know the relationship between frequency and energy. You can work that out. The other is to go back to the object dropped here. The object dropped here is gaining kinetic energy. It must be losing some other form of energy in order for it to gain kinetic energy. It loses gravitational potential energy. Gravitational, in relativity, gravitational potential energy is just a rather specific way of talking about rest energy. That is the energy a body possesses by virtue of its mass. All right? So how does a body lose rest energy? It loses rest energy by moving into a region in space where time runs more slowly. If time runs more slowly, everything is less energetic. If you can imagine a, a world in which time is slowed down by a factor of two, everything has only a quarter of the kinetic energy. But it'll also, also have a quarter of the chemical energy, a quarter of the heat energy. A quarter of the rest energy? No, I don't think so. I think that's a mathematical oversimplification. But you get the idea that by moving into a region of space where time runs more slowly, um, you can lose rest energy. It turns out the calculation for doing that in mild gravitational fields is relatively straightforward. In terms of the Earth's gravitational field, the amount of slowing down of time is about 14 parts per billion. That's about half a second per year. Clocks on the if you have two clocks, one on the surface of the Earth, one in outer space, the one on the surface of the Earth will, will be running, will lose time by about a quarter of a second per year. That's all it takes to provide the kinetic energy to reach 11.2 kilometers per second. Okay? Ah, yes, I hear you say. Well, that explains where the energy comes from. But it doesn't, doesn't explain why the object falls. How does it know which direction to accelerate in? Okay. The reason for that is that in a gravitational field, there is a gradient in the amount of slowing down of time. Okay. The rule in mild gravitational fields is if you double the distance from the center of gravity, you halve the amount of slowing down of time. So if you were to go 6,000 kilometers up into space, Gravity, uh, the slowing down of time would only be a quarter of a second per year. Okay. 
at any point in a gravitational field, there's a direction at which time is speeding up, up, and a direction at which time is slowing down, down. Now, here's a spacecraft hovering in empty space. It emits, it emits a flash of light. Exactly one second later, that, those photons will be exactly, well, slightly less than 300,000 kilometers in distance away. This is called a light bubble. Okay? And if the spacecraft is weightless, it will be exactly symmetrical. If the spacecraft is in a gravitational field, however, don't forget, the light is falling. Consequently, the bubble will be slightly off-center. Obviously, I've exaggerated this quite significantly. If we take these light bubbles and plot them on a space-time diagram, we get the future light cone. Remember that we talked about this <coughs> and when we we're talking about um, space-time. So here's our future light cone here. This is, a, this is a spaceship hovering in empty space. This is a spacecraft in a gravitational field. You can see that the light cone is warped, is bent. Consequently, the axis of the light, of the light cone is no longer exactly parallel to the time axis. What has happened in effect is that time has taken on a direction in space. It's a property of space itself. It's like a huge arrow pointing down. Your future is down, it says, and it manifests itself as a virtual acceleration. However, you're only aware of the virtual acceleration if you're resisting gravity. In order to resist gravity, you require an upwards force to hold you in the same position. Maybe a static force, as in someone standing on the surface of a planet, or hovering in a balloon, or it may be a dynamic force, as in someone hovering in a helicopter or hovering in a, in a rocket. If you're falling freely under gravity, you're completely unaware of the gravitational force because your own motion will cancel out the virtual acceleration of the gravitational field. Okay? If you're falling freely under gravity, it seems to you <coughs> you're just hanging in the empty space and the Earth is accelerating up to meet you. That's how it appears. So we can actually rewrite <coughs> Newton's first law of motion to include gravity using the language of space-time. And it would go something like this, just to remind you of Newton's first law of motion. Objects not acted upon by an unbalanced forces remain at rest for traveling constant speed in straight line. World lines not acted upon by unbalanced forces run parallel to the axis of the light cone. Okay? So a falling object isn't actually gaining energy at all. It's just converting a small amount of its rest energy into kinetic energy by moving into a region of the space where time runs more slowly. If a falling object isn't gaining energy, it's equally true that light isn't gaining energy either. It only seemed that way to start with because we were viewing it from a Newtonian perspective. The light doesn't become bluer as it falls. It appears bluer because it's coming from a region of space where time runs more quickly. And the opposite is true <coughs> the light travelling upwards. It doesn't become redder as it climbs. It appears redder because it's coming from a region of space where time run, runs more slowly. <coughs> <coughs> okay, I'm going to pause briefly there. That's the sort of essence, if you like, of general relativity. Does anybody want to ask any questions specifically about that? No, no, that's different. That's recessional redshift. This is gravitational redshift. It's not because the object is receding. It's because it's lower down in the gravitational field. Yeah. <coughs> This is the acceleration equivalent to what we've just been looking at. Here's a spaceship accelerating in empty space. I'd like you to imagine this is a very, very long spaceship. With acceleration, the red and blue shifts are provided by the Doppler effect. If B emits a flash of light, by the time it re reaches A, A will actually be moving away from B. Or at least moving away from B as it was when the light was was emitted, therefore it will appear red shifted. The opposite is true with A. A. A removes a flash of light. By the time it gets down to here, B will be approaching that light, so it will be blue shifted. Clocks at the front of an accelerating spacecraft run slightly faster than clocks at the back. 
This creates an apparent gravitational field. An object that's dropped will appear to fall and hit the bottom like that. <coughs> now, if this spacecraft has a length equal to the radius of the Earth, 6,000 kilometers in length, and it's accelerating at 9.8 meters per second per second, 1g, then the transformations between them will be, will be exactly the same as in the last diagram. Clocks at the back will be running more slowly by half a second per year. An object dropped from here will hit the bottom at 11.2 kilometers per second. So you can see how acceleration and gravity are equivalent. Okay. Right, <coughs> well that's the basics, but it's, well, up to now we've just been paddling in the shallows. It's trying now to launch out. Yes? Yeah. Well, I was thinking about light and stuff before, like a while ago, and that sounds like might like, really confusing, but you know, um, if something... Are we, has, we're we talking about black holes later. Perhaps, so, perhaps so you... The yeah. But the, the, the black holes have the gravitational force, right? Yeah. So, so you know how we look at like a star from one point of view and a star from another point of view, depending on how close it is to a you know, to a black hole, would light kind of travel faster? And well, I'm coming on to black holes. I think I will answer that question. You'll find later in the talk, I think I will have answered that question. All right? Thank you. We'll, we'll get there eventually. Uh, I'd like to ask you, the universe is uh, in a uh, spherical shape, right? Um, you've got uh, galaxies which are far away through lensing, and you've got the Andromeda galaxy very close. And it's a uh, blue shifted. Yeah. And that's, all the rest are red shifted. That, that's, that's due to motion, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's, that's not due to gravity. That's it. Because our galaxy is actually moving also yeah. towards that's, the other galaxy. That's motion. That's not, that's not gravity. Um, that, that's a different subject, I think. Um, what I want to do now is to move on and talk about something else. I think you'll find some of these questions will be answered as we get further, off, further along. Okay, it's time now to launch out into deep water. On the Earth, we've said time is slowed down by half a second per year. If that's the case, you might think in more powerful gravitational fields, time is slowed down by a greater amount. And indeed, this is so. On the surface of the Sun, time is slowed down by approximately a minute per year. On the surface of a white dwarf star, time is slowed down by more than an hour per year. The amount of redshift that that produced, even in the 19, 1920s, was measurable, was detectable. On the surface of a neutron star, time is slowed down by more than a month. And at the event horizon of a black hole, the clock stops completely. Time stands still on the edge of a black hole. Right? The escape velocity of a black hole is the speed of light, by definition. Right? Consequently, an object falling into a black hole will reach the speed of light as it crosses the event horizon. In order to reach the speed of light, all of the rest energy of the object has to be converted into kinetic energy. Frightening thought, eh? At least in a sense that is true. In another sense, it isn't. What on earth do I, mean, do I mean by that, you may ask? Well, let's ask this question. What is the speed of light at the event horizon of a black hole? Any offers? Any offers? Zero. You say zero. Any, any advance on zero? <laughs> 300 kilometers per second. 300 kilometers per second, right. You're both right and you're both wrong. The correct answer is, it all depends on your point of view. All right. It all depends who measures it. Now, I'd just like you to imagine for a moment that you are holding onto an ob a device for measuring the speed of light, and that you are falling into a black hole and measuring the speed of light at the same time. Okay? Now, this is a somewhat unlikely arrangement, I must admit. It would have to be a very, very large, supermassive black hole. All right. If it was a stellar mass black hole, you wouldn't be able to do it. You'd be ripped apart by tidal forces before you even reach the event horizon. But if it was a, a very large, multi-million solar mass black hole, you could in theory at any rate, fall into a black hole and measure the speed of light at the same time. Right? You wouldn't be able to tell anyone the result of your measurement because by the time you finish making it, you'd be inside the black hole. 
and you wouldn't have very long in your time to enjoy the results. Either within a few minutes or an hour or two, you still end up being spaghettified by tidal forces as you fell deeper into the black hole. Be that as it may, the result you would get would be 300,000 kilometers per second, that would be exactly the same as measured anywhere else. Okay? However, from our point of view, looking in from the outside, what that appears to us to be the speed of light at the event horizon of a black hole is zero. Because time is standing still, right? If time is standing still, then nothing is moving, and that includes light. Oh, yes, but you said, well, if nothing is moving, then by definition, nothing can have any kinetic energy. So what you said about the mass being turned into kinetic energy is a load of bollocks. Well, yes, I suppose that's true, but it doesn't actually make any difference. All right? From our point of view, looking in from the outside, all that happens when an object falls into a black hole is that the mass of the object becomes added to the mass of the black hole. If you multiply mass by c squared, you get energy. So another way of saying the same thing is to say that the energy of the object is added to the energy of the black hole. Now whether that energy is in the form of rest energy or kinetic energy or any other kind of energy makes absolutely no difference. It all disappears. It all disappears into the black hole and loses its identity. Black holes are extremely simple objects. All of the properties of a black hole can be deduced from just three parameters. Mass, angular momentum, and electric charge. Electric charge is of largely theoretical interest. Real black holes are, for all intents and purposes, electrically neutral. But the other, the other, prop, the other properties of black hole, mass and angular momentum, they're very real. John Wheeler had a, a good turn of phrase for this. John Wheeler was an American scientist working in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, and he, he, he did quite a lot of work on black holes. He, and he had a very vivid grasp of the English language. He was the guy who popularized the term black hole. Okay, And he also said black holes have no hair. In other words, you know, um, they're perfectly smooth and, and no other properties about them. We'll talk a bit more about black holes later. What I want to do now is to see what happens when light passes a massive object. Here's the sun, or star, and here's the light from a distant star passing the sun. If light falls, you'd expect light to follow a curved path as it passes at a massive object. Remember the beam of light in the accelerating room? The slowing down of time in a gravitational field provides a mechanism for making the light bend. From his viewpoint, as light goes in deeper into a gravitational field, it appears to slow down and then speed up again. It's just the, object of, just the opposite of an ordinary object. Ordinary objects speed up as they enter gravitational fields and then slow down as they leave them. Light appears to do the opposite from his viewpoint. Okay? You can't see the light when it's down there. You can only see the light when it hits your eye here. And if you measure its speed, then it will be 300,000 kilometers per second. Right? Even though you can't see the light, you can see a little, a little man down here measuring the speed of the light. This little man will tell you the speed of the light is 300,000 kilometers per second. But you won't agree with his measurement because his measurement is made using his clock, which is running slow as compared to your clock. According to your clock, light seems to take longer to traverse a particular distance deeper in the gravitational field. So what effect does that have on the light? Well, it will refract the light. If you imagine a light wave coming along here, those parts of the light wave that are closer to the sun will travel more slowly than those parts of the light wave further away from the sun. So the light will be refracted. It's an achromatic refraction. It doesn't depend on the color of the light. In 1911, Einstein published a paper in which, working from the law, the law of conservation of energy, he was able to calculate the amount of slowing down of time in the sun's gravitational field. And from that, he was able to calculate the uh, amount of curvature of light passing the sun. Obviously, I've exaggerated this enormously here. He worked out that a star just outside the limb of the sun, the image would be displaced outwards by a very small amount. And the figure he came up with in 19. 11 was 0.85 seconds of arc. All right. However, the figure that he came up with in 1911 was not the same as the figure that he arrived at when general relativity was completed in 1915. At that time, he worked out that it was uh, deflected by a significantly greater amount, double the amount, in fact. And the reason for that was that he'd only solved half the problem. He was only halfway towards his general theory of relativity. And the reason is this. 
let's take a particular distance in the gravitational field. And let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that time is slowed down between A and B by 10 parts per billion, let's say. Now, is that 10 parts per billion as viewed by this chap, or 10 parts per billion by, as viewed by this chap? In mild gravitational fields, the difference is negligible. I mean, whether you're starting off from a year, slowing down by half a second from a year, or speeding up by half a second from a year minus half a second, what's the difference? A few parts per billion. But as you get into more powerful gravitational fields, you'll start to find that these two will start to disagree about the amount of time over that particular distance, because they're starting from a different baseline. He's slowing down from here. He's speeding up from here. His seconds aren't the same as his seconds. In other words, the viewpoints are no longer exactly complementary. They start to become contradictory. Okay, follow me so far. If they're not directly contradictory, like in special relativity, they still agree that time is slowing down as you go down and speeding up as you go up. But they'll disagree about the amount of time over a particular distance. And the more powerful the gravitational field is, the more they will disagree. Understand? Now, whether Einstein realized this in 1911 or not, I don't know. But what he didn't realize is that this disagreement about the amount of slowing down of time also results in a disagreement over measurements of distance. These two guys won't agree what this distance is. In relativity, if you disagree over time, you must also disagree over distance, and vice versa. You remember that from special relativity. Well, a similar thing happens in general relativity. So what effect does that have? Well, the effect of that is that not only does gravity slow down time, it also distorts space. What on earth do I mean, what do we mean by that? You can distort an object in space, but how can you distort space itself? What it means is that you can no longer use the normal mathematics of geometry to, to describe space around a massive object. Space around a massive object has become non-Euclidean. So what does that mean? Well, Euclid, of course, was a Greek mathematician who was really one of the founders of geometry. He produced a series of axioms and equations that we all learn in school when we do elementary geometry. In the 19th century, various mathematicians looked at Euclid's geometry from a critical point of view and started analyzing it logically. And everything went fine until they got to the parallel lines axiom. There's a number of ways of uh, expressing this, but basically it's if you, sorry, if you draw if you draw a line here and another line here crossing it, and you choose a point here, there's only one line that you can draw through that point at which if extended to infinity in both directions won't hit this other line. Okay? Uh, the first chapter to look at it. In the last century, in the 19th century, was a chap called Bolyai, and there was another guy called Lobachevsky. And they thought, well, I can't see how this axiom can be derived from the foregoing axioms, so let's try reversing it. Let's suppose that you can draw several lines through this point. And rather than producing contradictions in the mathematics, they found they could actually produce a perfectly consistent system of geometry. It's called hyperbolic geometry. It actually describes. Uh, objects on a hyperbolic surface, or lines drawn on a hyperbolic surface, like that. Or like that, for example. A little later, a German called Bernhard Riemann was even more radical. He said, well, if you, let's suppose that you can't draw any lines through there at all. And again, he discovered the same thing. He, he developed a different system of geometry again, which was called elliptical geometry or spherical geometry. These systems of geometry were mathematically incompatible with one another. All of a sudden, mathematics seemed uncertain. How can there be lots of different systems of geometries that are contradictory to each other? Which one is the true one? Henri Poincaré, the French mathematician, was very interested in that. And he was particularly interested in that question. And what, the way he answered it, he said, as, he said as, as follows. He said, all of these systems of geometry are mathematically valid, even though they're mutually contradictory. The choice of to which system of geometry you use in practice isn't a matter of mathematics, it's a matter of practicality. Asking which one is, is the true one is a meaningless question. It's a bit like asking whether the imperial system of measurement is true or the metric system of measurement is true, or whether a Mercator map is true or a polar map is true. Maps can't be true or false by virtue of their projection. They can be true or false by virtue of whether the details are filled incorrectly or not. 
But asking whether Mercator map or a polar map is true virtuous projection is a meaningless question. You can, however, ask whether they are practical. Mercator maps work extremely well in low latitudes, but if you try and use a Mercator map on a polar, a polar expedition, you won't get very far. For ordinary everyday life, and for most purposes of physics, Euclidean geometry works extremely well. That fact has been taken for granted for over 2,000 years. However, the fact that it works well isn't a mathematically necessary fact. It's an empirical fact. It just happens to be the way the world is. And like any other empirical fact, it can be tested scientifically. It turns out that you have to use Riemann geometry in order to describe space around a massive object uh, in a powerful gravitational field. Now, at this point, Einstein realized he needed some help. Although he could visualize the nature of the problem, he didn't have the necessary mathematics at his fingertips to actually work it out in detail. So he turned to this chap, who was a friend of his, called Marcel Grossman. Grossman was a professor of mathematics in Zurich. He and Einstein had been close friends since they'd been students together in Zurich some years earlier. He'd, he'd been a much more diligent student than Einstein. And he provided Einstein with the mathematics he needed. He provided him with Riemann geometry. And he also provided him with a method for calculating the way in which space is curved. And this is called tensor calculus. Um, tensor calculus is uh, a form of mathematics that had been developed by a couple of Italian mathematicians. A tensor is like a rather complicated vector. You know about vectors. Vectors are numbers that have direction as well as magnitude. Well, a tensor also has direction, but instead of just acting in a single direction like a vector, it spreads out in several directions. Okay? I think I'm right in saying a tensor is a combination of vectors. I may be wrong. The mathematicians among you may correct me here. Um, you imagine three planes at right angles. And in each plane, you, you draw a vector. And you then combine them together. That's a tensor. That's probably a simplistic way of thinking about it. Without going into the actual mathematics, is there some simple way that idiot non-mathematicians like myself can picture how this works? And the answer is, in three dimensions, I'm afraid we can't. We live in a world which is Euclidean. We can't, and our minds are Euclidean. We can't actually picture non-Euclidean space. It's impossible. But we can picture it in two dimensions. Now, I've already given you a couple of examples of that, but here's a couple more. Uh, this is what's called a positively curved surface, and you notice that the angles of a triangle are greater than 180 degrees. This is what's called a negatively curved surface, and you notice that the angles of a triangle are less add up to less than 180 degrees. So using this technique, is there some simple way that idiot non-mathematicians like myself can visualize the way in which gravity distorts space? Best way is to think of space as a, uh, a stretchy rubber sheet. And putting a massive object in space will distort the space. And this gives you a pretty good feel for the way in which gravity distorts space. What it does is it pulls in horizontal distances and pulls out vertical distances. Okay? So as you go deeper into a gravitational field, space becomes squeezed from side to side and from back to front and stretched from top to bottom. Right? There are, however, a number of shortcomings of this diagram that you have to be very much aware of. The first is that this degree of deformity is very, very gross. In reality, you wouldn't get that amount of distortion except in the immediate vicinity of a black hole or possibly a neutron star. With ordinary objects, the effect is much, very much more subtle. In the case of the Earth, the excess radius is about 1.5 millimeters. And the loss of surface area is about 60 acres. Now, that may sound a fairly big area, but when you remember that the surface of the Earth is nearly half a billion square kilometers, 60 acres is uh, pretty much a drop in the ocean. In the case of the Sun, the excess radius is about 400 meters. And the loss of surface area is about the size of the United States. Now, that may sound a pretty, pretty big area, but as a proportion of the total surface area of the sun, it's actually pretty small. It's about one and a half millionth of the surface area of the sun. Secondly, that diagram only shows you what's going on in two dimensions. In reality, it's something that's three-dimensional. Um, it's mathematically describable. We can't picture it. If you want to know what non-Euclidean space looks like, look at your reflection in the mirror of your telescope and move it around, or look through an objective lens and move it around. It's pretty distorting. Right? One of those curved mirrors will give you a feeling of non-Euclidean space. Pretty, pretty distorting. 
Thirdly, it only shows you half of what's going on. It shows you the, the curvature of space, but it doesn't show you the slowing down of time. I think you can see that light passing through curved space, the curvature of space will cause light to bend. Okay? However, don't think that all the curvature of light is caused by the curvature of space. It isn't. Only half the curvature of light is caused by the curvature of space. The other half is caused by the slowing down of time, as we've already discussed. It turns out that the amount of curvature produced by curvature of space and by slowing down of time is actually the same. And there are sound mathematical reasons for that. The reason, I, the way I think of it is what's actually being curved is space-time, four-dimensional space-time. And because light always travels at exactly 45 degrees relative to the time axis, any distortion of space-time will affect the space and time components equally, as far as light is concerned. However, to work out the curvature of light, you have to add the two together. One of the last things that Einstein did when he completed general relativity in 1915 was to double his estimate for the curvature of starlight passing the sun. It's not 0.5 seconds of arc, it's actually 1.7 seconds of arc. So how does the curvature of space affect the behavior of ordinary objects in a gravitational field? Well, in mild gravitational fields, you really don't need to worry about the curvature of space. The inverse square law, Newton's law, is explained perfectly well by the slowing down of time. Um, the curvature of space is only relevant to ordinary objects if they're traveling at relativistic speeds or when we come to look at very powerful gravitational fields. So now let's ask the question, how does gravity as described by relativity differ from gravity as described by Newton? What I've done here is I've taken a massive object, a star, let's say, and on this axis I've plotted distances from the star. This is the center of the star here, this is the surface of the star here, and these are distances out in space. The vertical line represents the strength of the gravitational field. The blue line represents Newton's law. If you halve the distance to the center of the star, it's, it's exactly four times greater. If you halve the distance again, it's four times greater again, and so on, until you reach the surface of the star. Right? Once you get below the surface of the star, of course, the rules change completely. Gravity actually diminishes as you go inside a massive object because the matter above you cancels out the matter below you. However, let's simply ignore that fact. Let's just continue extrapolating this graph according to the same mathematical rule. What we're doing mathematically is we're compressing the same mass into smaller and smaller volume, okay, and seeing what happens. So what happens is that with Newton's law is that for every halving of the distance of the center of gravity, there's a fourfold increase in the gravitational field. And it tends towards infinity at the center of the object. The red line represents gravity as a cause as described by relativity. So how does it differ? Well, in my gravitational field, it's exactly the same. And it would be surprising that that were not the case. Newton's law had been highly successful for nearly 200 years before relativity had been developed. If it was obviously very different, it would obviously have been wrong. The difference comes in powerful gravitational fields. What happens is that as you approach a massive object, the effect of gravity increases ever so slightly more rapidly than you would expect from Newton's law. In other words, if you halve the distance, gravity increases by a factor of four plus a tiny bit more. And if you halve the distance again, it's another factor of four plus a bit more still. And each time you go inwards, the bits are increasing in size. And they're increasing in relative size as well as in absolute size. Okay? If we then extrapolate this graph according to the same mathematical rule, what happens? Well, it just deviates more and more and more from the Newtonian uh, line, and, and it tends towards infinity, not at the center of the object, but at some distance from the center of the object. The distance from the point at which it becomes infinite to the center of the object is called critical radius, or Schwarzschild radius, after Carl Schwarzschild who first calculated it. What we've done is we've created a small sphere which has an infinite gravitational attraction. What we've done is we've created a theoretical black hole. Okay? The size of the black hole depends on the mass of the object. In the case of the Earth, the black hole, the mass of the Earth will be about that big. In the case of the Sun, it's about four or five kilometers in, di di in diameter. The formula that Carl Schwarzschild came up with was actually a very simple one. The radius of a black hole equals 2 gm over c squared. 
G is the gravitational constant. M is the mass of the object. C, of course, is the speed of light. Now, there's two things I'd like to notice about this equation. One is this figure 2 here, which I'll talk about in a minute. The other is that the, mass of black, the radius of a black hole is directly proportional to the mass. If you double the mass of a black hole, you double its radius. So the surface area of a black hole increases as the square of the mass. The volume of a black hole increases as the cube of the mass. Right? They're not like ordinary objects at all. Right? So what effect does this have on uh, orbital dynamics? Well, if you have a two-object system uh, orbiting around one another, uh, according to Newton's law, the axis of the ellipse doesn't change. It remains completely constant. In reality, they do change due to the gravitational attraction of other objects. But if it's a pure two-object system, it doesn't change. With relativity, however, even a two-object system, the axis will process slightly, depending on the mass of the object. So what causes this deviation here? Half of that deviation is caused by the disagreement about the amount of slowing down of time. The other half is caused by the curvature of space. Half of the diameter of a black hole occurs when time grinds to a halt. The other half is caused by the bottom falling out of space. Hence the relevance of that figure too, I mentioned. A black hole is double what you might think by any quasi-Newtonian calculation for exactly the same reason that Einstein's final calculation of the curvature of light was double his original estimate. There's a direct mathematical link between the size of the black hole and the amount of curvature of light. Okay, uh, oh, what's happened there? I'm not sure what's happened there. Anyway, not to worry. Um, I think it's just a picture of black hole. Not, not very important to me. Well, let's talk a little bit more about black holes. I don't want to spend too much time talking about them. Black holes are primarily theoretical entities. That is to say, they existed in theory a long time before they existed in reality, or before we had any reason to suppose that they existed in reality. Okay? Uh, the only person who really took much interest in the early days was Carl Schwarzschild, who calculated, made that calculation. But he didn't believe that black holes actually existed. He just thought he was doing an exercise in pure mathematics. Einstein didn't like the idea of black holes. Neither did Eddington, actually. They didn't think they really existed at all. This is a picture of one of the people who first believed that black holes actually existed in reality. And his name was Subramanian Chandrasekhar. He was an Indian postgraduate student at Cambridge uh, in the 1920s and 30s. And he was working on white dwarf stars. And he calculated that there was a ma maximum mass of a white dwarf. His supervisor was a chap called Ralph Fowler, who was uh, actually um, um, Rutherford's son-in-law. Rutherford was working on white dwarfs. Uh, but, but Chandrasekhar realized that the electrons in white dwarf stars would be traveling at relativistic speeds, so he had to take into account the effects of special relativity. And he worked, out, he worked out that a white dwarf couldn't be more massive than about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. So what would happen to a star that had a core that was more massive than that at the end of its life? Neutron stars hadn't been invented at that stage. The only other option was a black hole. And he put this forward in the um, a paper. But unfortunately he was completely trashed by Eddington. Eddington was the big, was the big cheese in those days and they, he didn't agree with what he said. And Eddington actually put back uh, astronomy by a few decades at least as far as black holes was concerned. Chandrasekhar was actually right and he went on to have a very distinguished career in astrophysics. But not at Cambridge, in other places. <laughs> um, this is a diagram of light bubbles. This is an object in weightless and empty space, and you can see the light bubbles are perfectly symmetrical. This is an object in a gravitational who is resisting a gravitational field. You can see the light bubbles are slightly off center. This is an object at the surface of a black hole. All the light bubbles are expanding within the black hole. So the acceleration equivalent 
of standing still at the black hole would be the equivalent of, of, of traveling from rest to the speed of light instantaneously. All right. When you're inside the black hole, things are even worse. It looks like this. This is a diagram from Roger Penrose, um, a space-time diagram. So this is the time axis here. This is the space axis. This is a star collapsing into a black hole. These, these represent the light cones. And notice that the light cones are tilting over. And as you pass the event horizon, the light cone is tilted over by 45 degrees. So all the light is going inside the black hole. And eventually, it will go to a geometrical point called a singularity here. R equals 2M, event horizon, there you go. Now, real black holes rotate, they spin. The mathematics of a spinning black hole were worked out in the 1960s by this guy called Roy Kerr who is a Kiwi. He's still alive, actually. He, he was a professor of mathematics in Christchurch. In fact, he was interviewed by Kim Hill on, on, on a Saturday morning a, a few months ago. He must be about 90 now. But he worked out the mathematics of rotating black hole in Cambridge in the 1960s. Cambridge, UK, that is. So what does a spinning black hole look like? Well, this is a non-spinning black hole, so-called Schwarzschild black hole. This is the event horizon. And this is a singularity. These are two rotating black holes of increasing angular, of similar mass but increasing angular momentum. What happens is that the event horizon actually shrinks slightly, but it's surrounded by this area that I've called E. And E is what's called the ergosphere. The ergosphere is a very strange region where space is literally spinning around the black hole. If you fall towards a spinning black hole, gravity doesn't just pull you inwards, it pulls you sideways. And as you enter the ergosphere, you're traveling at the speed of light, but you're traveling horizontally. You're traveling around the black hole. You cannot not rotate. It's impossible not to rotate when you're in the ergosphere. Okay? You can still escape from the ergosphere, theoretically, provided you don't cross the event horizon. If you, obviously, if you cross the event horizon, there's no escape. Okay? What about the singularity? What's that like? Well, is it a point, or what is it? Well, in a sense, it's a point, but the position of that point appears to vary depending on the direction you're looking at the black hole. If you're looking at it from this side, the point appears to be there. If you're looking at it from the other side, it appears to be there. If you walk around the black hole and trace out the position that the singularity appears to be, it actually forms a ring. There is a maximum amount of... Uh, uh, of um, spinning that a black hole can have. As it gets faster and faster, the uh, event horizon moves inwards and the singularity moves outwards and the two can never meet. Okay, so you can't, there is a limit to how fast a black hole can spin. If there was a system that had too much angular momentum, it wouldn't form a, black, a single black hole. It would form two black holes or a neutron star and a black hole or something like that. Okay, well, I think we've more or less finished the theoretical side of it. What I want to do now to finish off, how are we doing? Oh, gosh. We're going over a bit, aren't we? I'll very quickly try to finish this. Um, these are just some pictures of... Um, this is an artist's impression of a spinning black hole uh, forming a quasar. Uh, this is a, an actual quasar. This is the galaxy M87, and there is a black hole in the centre of M87 producing a relativistic jet. Uh, which comes out from the pole of the black hole. But the black, this, is, this is the core of the galaxy, and the black hole is somewhere in the centre of that. You can't see the black hole, obviously. Or, hmm. Right, now, general relativity was completed in 1915, but just because a scientific theory is completed doesn't mean that it's, it's true. You have to have some observational confirmation. The first observational confirmation, well, it wasn't an observational confirmation, it was a theoretical explanation of a known observational anomaly. Um, Mercury, the axis of Mercury's orbit precesses around the Sun very slowly, at a little over 300 arc seconds per century. Um, Urban Le Verrier calculated the effect of the other planets using Newton's law of gravity. 
Um, but after he'd finished his calculation, it was realized Mercury was actually processing faster than he predicted. He thought a new planet was orbiting inside Mercury called Vulcan that was causing this. Vulcan never turned up. Okay? Various other people tried to explain why Mercury was processing faster than, than, um, than it should have done. Uh, Einstein calculated um, using general relativity, the effect of relativity on the precession of Mercury. And he worked out that just in a pure two object system, Sun and Mercury, Mercury would precess at 43 arc seconds per century, which was the exact figure between observation and, and what was thought to be true. So, so his, that was the first thing. Star images near solar eclipse. There was a solar eclipse um, in 1919, which was after the, after the First World War. Um, and Eddington and his team went out and photographed the eclipse, and they photographed images of stars near the eclipse. They then came back to, to uh, England and they compared the position of the images with images taken from Cambridge six months earlier of the same area of the sky. And they found indeed that the images had been displaced outwards. This wasn't a very precise um, measurement, but nevertheless it did. It was sufficient to confirm Einstein's theory of general relativity. This was what rocketed Einstein to international fame in this particular test. Sirius B, that was a, a white dwarf star, uh, which he demonstrated a gravitational redshift of about equivalent to about 20 kilometers per second redshift, recessional redshift, um, which confirmed that Sirius B is indeed a very tight, a very dense uh, star with a very high gravitational field. I'll just very quickly flip, flip through some of the other things. Um, this, this is special relativity. Of course, we talked about this last week. We talked about nuclear physics last month. Particle accelerator is also special relativity. GPS satellites, of course, have to be adjusted for the effects of relativity, both general and special. Radar reflections from planets. You can get a reflection from the planet Venus when it's the other side of the sun and the radar beam will be passing close to the sun, and you can measure the extra time it takes due to the slowing down of the sun's gravitational field. <coughs> that was the first, one of the first black holes to be thought of, um, Cygnus X1. Um, it's a very dense object. Uh, it's a, a binary star, and there's a very, very dense object orbiting around another giant star, giving off X-rays, and the only way to explain what it was. It was too massive to be a neutron star. And um, the only way to explain what it was is to suppose it was a black hole. Double neutron stars. These are, these are interesting. Pulsars. Double pulsar. Giving off pulses of radiation. Um, pulses of, of, of uh, um, radio waves. And by timing them very precisely, you can demonstrate the precession in the orbit. And also over time, you can demonstrate that the orbit speeds up very, very slowly due to gravitational radiation, observational cosmology. And since I first gave this talk some years ago, I've had to add an extra one on gravitational waves, of course, which is the most modern um, development um, in interpreting gravitational waves. All the equations of general relativity have to be used to sort out what it is that's colliding. So I'll just finish with a few little pictures. This is an Einstein cross. This is a galaxy here, and this is four images of another galaxy beyond it. So this is all one galaxy, but there's four separate images due to gravitational lensing. This is a James Webb telescope picture, and you can see these arcs here are distant galaxies uh, that are being, uh, the light is being refracted by this large massive galaxy in the foreground. So this is gravitational lensing. And this is uh, the LIGO, one of the LIGO instruments used for detecting gravitational waves. I rather skimped through that because we're running over to time. This is one of the first, if not the first, detection of gravitational waves by the LIGO detectors. This is one of the detectors and this is the other detector. 
uh, both in the United States, these ones, and these are the waves that they detected. Caused by two colliding black holes. Okay, I'm going to stop there. We've gone over a bit, I'm afraid. Any questions? What I've tried to do is to sort of start from first principles without the mathematics, just to try and get you to visualize slowing down of time, bending space, and how that fits together, and uh, how it explains things. Thank you very, very much. Oh, oh my goodness! Something me. to harden up your coronary I'm, arteries. I haven't, yeah. haven't finished the last box yet. Oh yeah, better. Well, you've <laughs> well, you got a couple of hours to drive home, so it's been your time now. <laughs> oh, that's Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. It, um, what is the relationship between the gravitational waves and the Higgs boson, which they determine now um, has the gravitational weight? I haven't a clue. I don't know. Um, I mean, Higgs boson and particle physics is a different subject, really. I mean, I've just gone with the concept of mass as we, no or we normally understand it. I mean, Higgs boson is supposed to give things their mass. But how that relates to all this, I don't, I'm not quite sure. You'd have to ask somebody who works at this. Uh, Question from online. Uh, how does HR Hawking radiation, I assume, escape the black hole? Again, that is um, quantum mechanics, really. Uh, it's to do with the surface of a black hole and the fact that you can't specify in space. It, that, that's quantum mechanics, really. It, it's not really general relativity. Uh, it, it's the application of quantum mechanics to the curved space at the edge of a black hole. Um, and uh, particles in, in empty space there are what are called virtual particles which appear from nowhere there's a particle and an antiparticle they separate and then come back together again and they're doing this all the time space is seizing, seizing with virtual particles the edge of a black hole when two particles form one of them can fall into the black hole and the other is left on the outside and that's seen as radiation the amount of radiation is incredibly small I mean Certainly with any, the larger the black hole, the less the curvature, so the cooler it is. It's only when you get to, theoretically, you could have very, very small black holes and they would be very hot, theoretically. But that's, again, that's quantum physics. That's not, that's not general relativity. <laughs> so, the thing about the ether and the light moving through the ether, which was all just proven and there's nothing there. So the, the gravitational waves, what are they moving through? Is there a gravitational They're moving through space. Yeah, they move through space in exactly the same way that light moves through space, at the same speed. Like radiation. So yeah, so it's a form of radiation. I mean, just, yeah, and, and um, they sort of consist of gravitons. You know, there's a particle way, the particle way of talking about it would be to talk of them as gravitons. But in, with ordinary objects, the gravitational waves are incredibly weak. And it's just as well they are, because if they weren't, the Earth would have spiraled into the Sun, and all the energy of the Earth's orbit would have spiraled, we'd have spiraled into the Sun a long time ago. So it's very, very weak. Oh, yeah. When I get no questions, I either think I've done a fantastic lecture and answered all of them, or else I've been a total bore and you haven't understood a thing of it. Hello. Uh, with the light distortion of a black hole, yeah. so if you had a star behind a black hole, would you ever be able to see two of the same star by a light distortion crossing over each other? Yeah, you would. Yeah. In fact, if it was directly behind a black hole, it would look like a ring. Around the black hole, the light would be refracted around the black hole and it would see it appear as a ring. That's exactly right. Yeah, clever. Yeah. Just going to say, a lot of black holes do that, even mass will do it. Yeah, that's right. Um, 
they can listen to one of the things they study in the centre of the Milky Way, look at the stars that randomly drops into a line of what the Earth. And when that happens, the foreground stars, gravity can actually magnify the, the star behind it. But what we see, we don't see them, is you see them increase in brightness. So they monitor these things all the time because they measure the light curves and it's done at the observatory here. If it happens to be a planet orbiting a foreground star, it distorts the lens a little bit and it actually shows up in the light curve. So it's a method of um, uh, sorry, detecting planets called gravitational microwave. <laughs> so basically any gravitating object will be in light, not just the black hole. Yeah, that's right. I like those arc pictures I showed from the from the James Webb telescope, those arcs were gravitationally lensed, yeah. Okay. Now, I'm not quite convinced gravity is weak force when I hop on the scales in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'd like to thank you very, very much. <laughs>